Hey everybody, and welcome to a new video. You've probably heard the term dynamic range before, but maybe you're curious about what exactly it is and how it impacts your photography. In this video, I'm going to explain what dynamic range is, how it's measured, and more importantly, practical photography tips on how to improve your photography results when dynamic range is a problem. Don't forget to stay for my bonus tip, where I show you what I did to get this photo in a very challenging lighting situation. My name is Simon Dantremont, and I'm a professional nature and wildlife photographer living in Eastern Canada. I make weekly videos giving you photo tips or taking you behind the scenes for nature photography. Subscribe if you want to see more. Okay, let's start off by understanding what dynamic range is. It's the measure of the ratio between the darkest and brightest signal that can be captured in a single image. And this is measured in stops of light, which are a doubling or halving of the amounts of light. Doubling the amount of light is one stop more, having the amount of light is one stop less. When you look at a scene, it will have a certain number of stops of tonal range from pure black to pure white. Like I'm showing you here, scenes that have darker darks and lighter lights will have more dynamic range. That is a greater variation from darks to lights. But here's the rub. How many stops of dynamic range can we capture? Our eyes interestingly can adapt to capture brighter and darker areas by squinting, like when going from outside on a sunny day to a dark movie theater. And parts of our retina can adapt to see in low light, but not in color. As such, there's no agreement scientifically on how many stops of light our eyes can see at once, with answers from 12 to 24 stops, depending on how it's measured. But first, a quick word from our sponsor, My Heritage. Now, I'm from a population of French Canadians called Acadians that live in the Atlantic provinces of Eastern Canada. In 1755, the English deported the French from this region, some of which ended up in Louisiana and became the Cajuns. Acadian, Acadians, Cajuns, right? The first Dantremont to arrive in the New World in 1651 came from La Rochelle, France, to be lieutenant to Charles de la Tour, governor of the region and head of the first permanent settlement in Canada, Port Royal. I think I'm mostly French, but I also know that my 13th grandfather, Nicolas Mius, originally German, was an interpreter for Gaspard de Coligny, a French admiral and leader of the Huguenots in France. They were both killed during the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre in 1572. So I'm lucky that I know a lot about my family history, but with all these twists and turns, what does my DNA tell me about my roots and the roots of my parents? So I partnered with my heritage and got a test kit and took a DNA test. It's quite easy actually. It comes in a handy kit and all you need to do is activate your kit online and take a few cheek swabs and then you send your sample into my heritage and wait a few weeks. So now my results are in and you're going to see them at the same time as me. I haven't seen them yet. So here we go. Simon, ready to explore your ethnicity. Let's go. Okay, Simon, you are, oh, spinning globe, 53.4% North and Western European. That's interesting, but where's the rest of me from? 38% Iberian? Didn't expect that. 6.8% uh, Italian? That's interesting. And 1.3% West Asian? <laughs> Where's that come from? Oh, that is, that's interesting. But obviously a lot of maybe the families of Acadians that came here a few hundred years ago, there must have been a large Iberian group, maybe from Spain or Portugal. Uh, the Portuguese were big explorers years ago, so that maybe explains why I have a, quite a large proportion of my DNA coming from Iberian sources. So that is really interesting. The West Asian, Iran, Turkey, Azerbaijan, Georgia, quite surprised there. Italian may be less surprised given a strong European contingent, but that is really, really interesting. Now, if we go into DNA matches, we can see where I have some close family identified, some extended family, and you can even get a map showing where your relatives live. 
and you can click on individual profiles if they've decided to share that information so you can find relatives. Wow, that was lots of fun. I'm lucky that I know a lot about my family history, but if you don't and you're really interested to know about your roots, give MyHeritage DNA a try. MyHeritage has a promotion on right now. Click on the link in the description or scan the QR code on your screen right now to start your 30-day free trial and use the coupon code SIMON1 for free shipping. Camera sensors can be measured in terms of how many stops of light it can capture in a single image, with 12 to 14 stops of dynamic range being a solid result. In this scale from DSC Labs, each bar is one stop of light. To measure the dynamic range, you count how many bars you can see until you can't resolve the difference in the darks. Note that there may be a few stops in the darkest darks that you can distinguish, but may not be usable due to the noise inherent in the darkest darks. That can sometimes explain why you might see different measures of dynamic range from different sources for the same sensor. It's the difference between the total and usable dynamic range. And you may be thinking that means that a camera sensor with 14 stops of dynamic range can capture bright areas that are 14 times brighter than the dark parts. Actually, since one stop of light is doubling the light and a second stop is doubling that again and so on, that means that 14 stops of light is two to the power of 14, which is 16,384 times. But what happens when the scene you're trying to photograph has more dynamic range than the camera sensor can capture. If your scene has 16 stops of dynamic range, but your sensor only has 13, it means that there are bright and dark areas outside of what you can capture. That translates to whites and blacks that are clipped or pure white and pure black with no detail. So in a given scene, a sensor with better dynamic range will capture a wider variation in tones and will have fewer pure blacks and pure whites than a sensor with less dynamic range which captures a smaller variation in tones. When your scene has a greater dynamic range than your sensor can capture, you get blown out whites or crushed blacks. The most common scenario you will see in photography is a blown out sky with whites so bright that your camera can't record them. So now I'm gonna give you six tips on what to do when your scene has more dynamic range than what your camera sensor can capture. My first strategy is to underexpose the photo to protect the highlights from clipping. Like in this shot here, where I made the image so dark that the brightest whites were preserved. The reason the strategy works is that in digital photography, the clipping of whites and blacks isn't exactly the same. The clipping of whites comes from exceeding the number of photons that a single pixel or photosite on your sensor can capture, what's called the full well depth. After it's full, it can't capture anymore and is pure white. On the other hand, crushed blacks don't come from capturing zero photons. It comes from not having enough photons to separate the data from the noise inherent in the darks. As such, it's easier to recover dark darks than blown out whites. So if you underexpose your photo intentionally and raise the shadows in processing, you'll get a better result than overexposing to protect the blacks and trying to recover the whites in processing. So option one is to underexpose and protect those highlights and raise the shadows in processing. Those shadows may be a bit noisy, but it's better than clipping. The second strategy is to shoot at a lower ISO by maybe using a tripod or long shutter speeds. The reason this works is that as you raise your ISO, the dynamic range goes down. You can see an example of this from my Canon R5 on the website Photons to Photos. The reason it works this way is that as the ISO goes up to make up for the lack of light, the noise in your image goes up. This noise makes it more difficult to differentiate the stops of light in the dark parts of your image. So lower your ISO when you can, that is get more light onto your sensor with wider apertures or longer shutter speeds, and you will have more dynamic range to play with. Note that I don't recommend lowering your ISO for more dynamic range above getting the shot. If you have low light and you need shutter speed to freeze the action, use the ISO needed to get the shot. In this case here, in the pre-dawn with my lens wide open at f2.8, I still needed ISO 5000 to get only 1 50th of a second shutter speed handheld. And I was able to get this photo. Does it bother me that it has only six stops of dynamic range? No, it was what was needed to get the shot. The top priority, period. The third strategy is to shoot in RAW. 
Raw image files contain more tonal data and as such capture more dynamic range than formats like JPEG. One strategy that some people use is that they shoot in both RAW and JPEG at the same time, keeping a copy of both on their memory cards. When the dynamic range is low and the shot well exposed, they use the JPEG, but when the dynamic range is high, they use the RAW for better processing options. The fourth strategy is to recompose the shot to get the overly bright parts out of the frame. If you're shooting right into a full bright sun, the scene will by definition have full sun and shadows in it. This is a common problem area for dynamic range. If you can recompose slightly and get the sun out of the shot, it will lessen the dynamic range of the scene. Another option is to put the sun right behind your subject, putting it out of view. A fifth technique is to use neutral density filters, but you can't lessen the dynamic range of a scene by putting a filter on the whole lens. The ratio of bright to dark stays the same when you do that. The technique to use is to put a filter on the bright part of the scene like the sky and hence darkening the sky only. That way, in one image, you can capture the whole range of the scene. There are various manufacturers who make neutral density filters on a glass plate with only part of the glass plate, which you would put in front of the sun that has a filter on it. The rest is clear glass, letting the regular exposure come through. Another technique is called HDR, or high dynamic range, where you accomplish similar to what the previous method did, but digitally. In fact, this latter technique is taking over from using filters for many photographers as it can be done easily. The HDR technique involves shooting multiple exposures, such as one properly exposed, one underexposed, and one overexposed, and combining them digitally. Most cameras can be set to shoot these three exposures in a row, and in a program such as Lightroom, you choose all three images, and right-click, hit Photo Merge, HDR, and it will create one image using the darkest parts of the lightest image and the lightest parts of the darkest image, effectively increasing the dynamic range of what you can capture. This technique is usually best used on static targets like landscapes, as combining three frames with moving subjects can be tricky. That being said, it can be done, like in this shot of mine from my recent trip to Kenya. By combining these three images, I get to preserve the brightest highlights and at the same time, my darks are not terribly underexposed and I improve the image quality in them. And finally, I promised you a bonus tip, and that's to not worry about it. That's right, for those who always strive to get the best image quality, I've given you the tips to do that, but I'd be remiss if I were to suggest that always fussing over your dynamic range will make you a better photographer. It won't. It may make better image quality, but not better photos. Now, someone out there I'm sure will say, oh, blown out whites and crushed blacks are the sign of a bad photographer. Bullpucky. There are tons of top tier photographers in the world that intentionally blow out their whites or crush their blacks into pure black as part of their visual art and create masterpieces with it, like in these photos. The same goes for painters that have done this for centuries, like these. And in film, like the movie 300, where blacks were crushed and the whites blown out on purpose, and in doing so created an amazing visual treat. So my advice is don't always look to manage the lack of dynamic range, but rather use the lack of dynamic range as a route to more dramatic and compelling images. I'm giving you the tools to understand dynamic range. Now it's your turn to figure out which strategy to use when. In this photo from Kenya, I could use the HDR technique and combine these images, or use an underexposed image and brighten the shadows. But instead, why don't I use one with a blown out section of the sky for dramatic effect? Then raise the shadows and play with a few parts of the photo and voila, a photo with crushed blacks and blown out whites, but having a unique look and still showing the subject in their environment. And don't forget to give my heritage a try if you want to find out about your family history and your roots. It's really fun and easy to do. Go check them out. Link in the description below. If you found this video deserving, give it a like and YouTube will share it with other photographers looking to understand dynamic range and how to incorporate it into their photography. And I hope that you can put this knowledge to getting your own unique and amazing photos. I know you can do it.